So thanks for stopping by the channel again. Make sure you are subscribed. Make sure you like the video and share it. Share the channel. Um, get this information out there. This is, uh, like I said before, I think everything that I have to say is important. Otherwise, I wouldn't say it. And I think you'll find it important too. Uh, this video is going to be the second video in my series about Joseph McCarthy. Um, I gave some history of uh, McCarthy-like tactics in the last video. And... Um, and I also gave some examples of how that type of tactic is being used today uh, with the uh, unfounded accusation uh, methodology of the, the leftist today in society. Today's video is not going to be specifically about um, just today's culture, today's society, but I want to talk a little bit about the specifics of what McCarthy got wrong. Uh, because as I said in the other video, McCarthy got some stuff wrong, uh, but he also was right about some things. And the next video is going to be what he got right and why I would say that he was right. But today we're going to talk about what he got wrong in the precedence that he set. So if you remember, um, we talked a little bit about some of the people who were um, accused of being Marxist, accused of being leftist, accused of being communist. Um, I mentioned the the Rosenbergs. Um, sorry, I got that uh, wrong. I said Rosenthal's in the video, and it's not Rosenthal. It's Rosenbergs. They I, I should have had it right, and I apologize for not having it right. It's not very professional of me. Um, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were some of the people that were accused of wrongdoing. And they were tried, they were convicted, and they were eventually executed by electrocution at Sing Sing. And the, the reason that I, I start off with them is because there's a building point that you, in any conversation that you have to be willing to have, you have to have a basis. And, and more often than not, that basis is this, the ID or the idea that in every single conversation, there's going to be things you're going to nail and there's going to be things that you're going to completely miff. And, and so what happened to the Rosenbergs happened rightly and, and should have happened. They, they were terrible uh, traitors to the United States. Execution. I, I don't know. I haven't read enough of the documents about the Rosenbergs to be able to tell you that I know for a fact how many people were physically harmed um, or uh, put in harm's way by the actions of the Rosenbergs, other than the fact that they sold, um, or not really sold, but gave over nuclear secrets to Soviet Union. That is bad. So they they brought on themselves what they got. So what we have to understand with Joseph McCarthy was that his intentions were good, albeit very heavy handed. His intentions were good. As I said before, he had a bee in his bonnet. And when you get a bee in your bonnet, as the old saying goes, it's not a good thing. There's, you're, it's going to cause uh, overreaction. So where else have we seen this in the history of the United States? So I started off with um, talking about the French Revolution and how the tactics of the anti-religious, atheistic um, revolutionaries of France led to um, the use of false accusations to silence people who didn't toe the line. But where did we see this in the United States? Well, Arthur Miller gave us a really good example of that in his play, The Crucible, where he used the Salem witch trials as a metaphor for the McCarthy hearings. There again, the Salem witch trials were just wicked all the way around. There was absolutely um, no good that came of the Salem witch trials. And this is coming from a person who comes from kind of the same background as the Puritans who held the Salem witch trials. The Salem witch trials were evil. 
accusing someone of witchcraft because you don't understand what's going on it can be some to some degree understood in the context of the lack of understanding of science the lack of understanding of medicine and just natural occurrences but does that make what happened in salem and in surrounding areas okay no not at all and arthur miller recognized that as a vehicle to comment on what MacArthur was, was Joseph McCarthy, excuse me, what Joseph McCarthy was doing. And, and there again, as I said before, rightly so. Even if you agree with his position, and, and you'll hear in the next video the places where I agree, agree with McCarthy, even if you agree with his premise, you have to make sure that you're not exercising undue pressure, that you're not exercising or, or utilizing uh, false accusations to marginalize and de uh, um, demonize your opponents. And here in the United States, we also have to understand that even those things that are unpopular to us, to some degree, deserve to be heard. They deserve to be debated. And when you silence thought that you don't like and you keep it out of the public realm by force and by threat of imprisonment by threat of uh, blacklisting by threat of termination from your work or from from work from your employment you are actually legitimizing that which you are fighting against so uh, i'll use the example of those people today who have been targeted by antifa Antifa has spent a lot of time uh, going after people for the last few years, and that's gotten even worse here in the beginning of 2021. Um, others on the left, uh, political figures, um, appointed officials in, in different uh, jurisdictions, municipalities and cities are using their positions to target people who speak out against them. So when you target a person for um, persecution, because you don't like the fact that they're holding you accountable, targeting a person, be, targeting a person because they're not towing the right societal line. You might be able to get them shut down, but you're actually giving them a, a larger listening audience. And instead of having a debate or a discourse about the ideas that they're forwarding, what you're doing is actually driving people to them. So let's, let's take a look at the hardcore right here in the United States today. I can't stand the alt-right. I can't stand the hardcore right. I don't, I don't agree with white nationalism. I don't agree with black nationalism. I don't agree with any kind of nationalism that's based on ethnicity here in the United States. But what the left has done is they have falsely accused many people of being Nazis. They've falsely accused many people of being white nationalists. They've accused people of being white supremacists or white power. Um, they've accused people of all sorts of horrendous cultural crimes and societal um, woes. And what they've done is they have brought those people that are way out there on the far right into the spotlight. And instead of that spotlight shining on that rottenness, it's actually caused people to dig into the, these groups and to and try to make them understandable. And when you do that, you're going to drive people into those camps, whether you like it or not. And that happens frequently. And that's what McCarthy accomplished. MacArthur, or excuse me, McCarthy, I keep doing that. McCarthy drove people into the arms of the left with his tactics because he made people say, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why is this guy so rabid about this? Why is he seeking to work so hard to drive these people out of our culture and out of our society? And, and there was a sharp increase in interest in Marxism and communism after the McCarthy hearings, very sharp interest because he got a lot of stuff wrong. See, we have grown up in a time up until the last year and a half or so in particular, uh, but the last eight months especially, we have come and, and, and developed and matured in a time when we take things like 
freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. We take those things pretty for granted, really. Uh, we even take them for granted in, at the state and local levels. We believe that those things have always existed at the state and local levels. And it wasn't until the passing of the 14th or the ratification of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, that states and local municipalities were required constitutionally to defend your First Amendment rights in their jurisdictions and all the other amendments of the Bill of Rights. I want, let that sink in. The 14th Amendment is not all that old, ultimately, and compared to the history of the United States. And at a federal level, the only government entities that were required to, by the Constitution, not infringe on your Bill of Rights and not to infringe on your constitutional liberties, was the federal government. State and local municipalities could. And that was what was at play during the McCarthy hearings. They, how much protection did people in public service have? What kind of freedom of association could they have? What kind of freedom of association would they have or, or could they expect? And that bled out as I brought up before into um, private sector, especially into the entertainment industry as we call Hollywood. It wasn't just Hollywood, but that's where we saw the, the the biggest impact in the entertainment industry was Hollywood, the movie stars, uh, the personalities. So here's McCarth McCarthy. I'm going to get it right yet, I swear. Here's Mac Joseph McCarthy, senator from Wisconsin, taking prominence in, in basically 1950. Comes at the Red Scare, comes at the threat of of. Soviet communist Marxist intervention in the world um, and, and intervention into American uh, political structure. And he sees, he sees commies and Marxists everywhere, behind every blade of grass, behind every rock, and behind every tree. To some degree, I do too today. Uh, I'm not going to be calling for hearings, but we're going to get to that. And he starts lambasting them and he uses the power of his office to target anyone who runs afoul of his position. And many, 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 many innocent people, even if they had communist affiliations, suffered because of that. And that's not right. And there was something else that came into play with the McCarthy hearings, um, especially when he uh, stood up and, and had a, a fight with the army. And the spokesman for the army finally said to him, sir, do you have no decency, no decency at all, sir? Because of the attacks that he was leveling against the loyal military members. Not saying there weren't any communists or Marxists in the military back then. Just like I would never tell you there aren't today. It is now an accepted political position in the United States, which means they can't keep you from doing a lot when it comes to, to military service and other government service or elected office. Consider Bernie Sanders, an avowed Marxist. So what... McCarthy and his allies did, the, McC the McCarthyites, were, they was over, overboard heavy-handed. And it set a stage. One, it, it set us up for the interests that we now see in the United States for Marxism. But it also played into the hands of the Marxists who were actively trying to win influence in the United States. So, I've mentioned a man named uh, Antonio Gramsci before, and I've certainly uh, talked about Saul Alinsky, uh, probably what some of you would consider to be an inordinate amount of times. But it's very important in this conversation because while McCarthy was doing his thing, Marxists were actively infiltrating the United States. And McCarthy gave him cover. He doesn't know he did, but he did. He gave him a car. He gave him McCarthyite covering. 
while he was going after commies behind every tree and every rock and behind every blade of grass and in every institution, he was missing where the greater threats were coming at. See, Saul Alinsky, having studied under Antonio Gramsci and being a social Marxist and a, a Gramscian Marxist theorist, understood that you weren't going to take over the United States by violence. He understood that you were not going to take over the United States by taking over the government institutions. He understood what Gramsci taught, which was you have to take over a country through the long, slow trudge through the institutions. And those were the words that Gramsci used. Obviously, it would have been in Italian because he was an Italian. But translated into English, it's you take over the in a country by the long, slow trudge through the institutions. And so what were the institutions? The institutions, chiefly for Gramsci, especially in the United States, were, believe it or not, the church and the universities. Once you got the universities, you got education, which meant you could get all the other colleges. You get the high-level colleges, you get the high-level universities, you can get community colleges, you're going to get the schools, you're going to get um, the, the primary and secondary schools. You're going to get private schools a lot of times because where are teachers taught? Teachers are taught in colleges. Who's going to teach the teachers? Other teaching professionals. If you can start to get them to think like Marxists, they're going to have that Marxist mentality permeate how they teach. Now, does that mean every single teacher since they started the war or the trudge to the institutions is now a Marxist. Absolutely not. I don't, I don't see it that way, but you hear people constantly talking about, man, my kids are learning this, that, and other thing in, in school. And like, that's not what we teach in our house. How do I counter that? Well, you have to look at the institutions and we're seeing it in churches too. Churches are being overrun by leftist Marxist ideology. And a lot of times the people who have that ideology have no idea that they're even thinking that way because it's become such a natural part of who they are. And that's what McCarthy got wrong. See, McCarthy was so focused on getting the what he considered to be the obvious ones out that he missed the subterfuge that was happening right underneath his nose. There's no way around it. Look, so the founder of modern education in the United States of the modern government school system is, is John Dewey. Think of the Dewey Decimal System. And, and I'm going to paraphrase Dewey. Dewey said, look, the goal of modern education will be to get children out of the influence of their homes and out of the influence of the church so that the state becomes their primary indoctrinator. And the, it, it's indisputable. It, 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 those are his words. Dewey was a Marxist. It, it, proud Marxist. And what's the Marxist methodology? Indoctrinate and inculcate students into government think, how we want them to think. So do I think McCarthy should have been going after schools? No, that's not what I'm saying. But he actually played into the hands of the people who were planning a, a Marxist march into positions of power with unwittingly he had no idea he was doing it because he was getting some things wrong and that's where we need to be focusing right now we need to be understanding that he set the stage he set this up for what's happening today now what what premise did he provide what uh precedents did he set he set a precedence as i mentioned before for the way private citizens are being treated for private actions by culture and society and by their employers all right but there's a worse precedent that he set. he set a precedent that allows for government institutions consider uh the house uh, in the Senate right now at the federal level, holding hearings on individual uh, congressmen, accusing them of being uh, right-wing fanatics, accusing them of being part of the insurrection. They're just throwing out accusations, just throwing them out. No proof, 
no substance to the accusations. And they're trying to get them removed from committees. They're trying to get them kicked and or expelled out of Congress and out of the Senate. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene has been accused of a massive amount of cultural uh, sins. And they're doing their level best to get her removed. That's the precedent that McCarthy started. And the left is now using that against the right, against conservatives, against patriotic constitutional folks. And make no mistake, not only is Bernie Sanders an avowed Marxist, proud of it, proud of it. So is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She has no bones, makes no bones about telling people that she believes firmly in the principles of Marxism. And she's the same person who I talked about in, in a video back right after the election um, in, in 2020. She flat out said, we should have an, be building an enemies list. She didn't use the word enemies list, but that's what she was talking about. Like this, this congressman, this congresswoman, congress, congress individual, flat out said, we need to keep track of all these people who have supported Donald Trump. And after the election is over and after uh, Biden takes office, when this is all said and done, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this, we need to go and hold them accountable for their actions. In other words, they need to be brought to justice for their crimes. She wants to build an enemies list. What's that sound like? And how can she get away with that without anybody being standing up besides some, you know, little no-name guy like me out here in the middle of nowhere? Uh, how does she get away with that? She gets away with it because it's a precedence that's been set. Through the inception of the House Un-American Activities Committee and the McCarthy hearings and and even the actions of, of at the time, uh, allegedly right-leaning uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And what do we see now? The FBI is coming hard at anybody who was in Washington, D.C., whether they were actually involved in, in what they're calling the insurrection, uh, the violent riot at, that took place at the Capitol building. They, whether they were involved or not, they're coming at them hard, very hard. And so we have got to see that this beast that we're fighting today, it's not just Marxism. It's a precedence of government control over every one of your thoughts, actions, and deeds, because we're the government and we can do that. And if you think for a minute that we could not go back to those McCarthy hearings and have them not just used against Marxists and leftists, you don't think the Marxist left isn't, isn't going to use them against conservative patriotic people? Imagine being a private citizen, as we saw during the McCarthy hearings, getting called before a House committee or a Senate committee and ordered to talk, to incriminate yourself. And then if you refuse, being held in contempt of Congress and jailed for it. Yeah, that happened. And guess what? It could happen to you. And we have Joseph McCarthy to thank for that. We have the House Un-American Activities Committee to thank for that. There again, did they get some things right? Absolutely. But they also did some very dangerous things. So we, we have the House Un-American Activities Committee. We have Joseph McCarthy to thank for the tactics that are now being used against patriotic constitutionalists who have done nothing wrong other than speak their mind and exercise their First Amendment liberties. We have no one to blame right now, except for the precedent that was set by the anti-communist movement from the, from the 20s into the mid-50s. Should we be anti-communist? Absolutely. Do I personally want communists and Marxists serving in office? Absolutely not. I think they're dangerous. I don't think they should be trusted. So no, I, I don't. I don't think they should be trusted. And I, I think that, but they're, they're, they have the freedom to hold those political positions or that, that political worldview. They have that freedom and they should have the freedom to speak their mind and they should be protected from harm and they should be protected from imprisonment and they should be protected from uh, losing everything that they have. They should be protected from being fired from their job. They should be protected from being disciplined from their, in their work, especially if they're in the public sector. 
But that doesn't mean I have to support them or endorse them at all. They have that freedom. They have that liberty. Look, time and time and time and time again, the Supreme Court of the United States and uh, the lower courts of the United States, some at the state Supreme Court levels, some at district courts, regional courts, have held that the First Amendment it doesn't just protect that which is popular. It even more explicitly protects that which is deemed unpopular. And it has to. Because if it doesn't protect that which is unpopular, the shift in any given generation can silence all dissent. All dissent. And that's what McCarthy was after. And so we need to call him out for those things that he was getting wrong. And we need to not adopt those same tactics. Stand up for what you believe. Don't, don't cave into pressure. Fight for, for your liberties. And, and hold government servants accountable. When you see them doing things that are absolutely wrong, and you see somebody in that unenviable position of being persecuted by the, by the government, or by others, really, for speaking an unpopular opinion, by all means, stand with them. But don't wait gleefully for the moment where you can turn the tables on them and use those tactics against them. Because as we've seen, the tactics of Joseph McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities Committee are now being used against us. And not just at the level of Congress. It's happening all over culture. It's happening in public employment sector. It's happening in the private employment sector. It's happening in culture with, with people just harassing neighbors and accusing them of things. Without substance, without evidence, without any kind of actual witnessing of any actual crime or, or egregious offense. Just had a conversation today with someone who's in a fight for their for their job because someone just said, "Oh, they're a racist." Now this person has to fight against something that's just patently untrue. That's a McCarthy-like tactic. And right now, those of us that are on the conservative side, whether you're a reactionary conservative, traditional conservative, paleo conservative, whatever, right now, those guns are being trained on us. They're being trained on us. Sometimes they're being trained on us by the very people who should be the quickest to defend us. And we can't resort to their tactics. We fight for ourselves. We fight for our liberties. We fight for those things that are important to us, but we cannot resort to those tactics because if innocent people can be damned and guilty people like the Rosenbergs can be convicted and executed, how long before they start to use that on us? And trust me, this is coming from somebody who's got some skin in the game, okay? I have skin in the game on this one. I don't mind telling you that. Because those tactics are being used against me. Powerfully used against me. And if you're one of those people who's suffering the same things that I'm suffering, then you need to be aware of the tactics that are being used against you and you need to begin to foot, push back, fight back. And if you're one of those people who would like to use those tactics on somebody, you need to stop and think. What happens if those tactics will end up being flipped on you? Because there are people out there that when the script flips, they're coming for you in the same way that you're coming for people like me and all the other people that I've been talking about and representing here for the last few months, especially for the last um, month or so. That's not right. And I don't want it to be that way. But you don't get to push us around anymore. We're on to you. Like I said, McCarthy got some things wrong. 
We can't use all of his tactics, and, but we can learn from him. And we can also recognize what, what McCarthy recognized. There is a Marxist threat in the United States today, and there has been for a very long time. But we need to see it where it is, and we need to see it for what it is. And we need to fight it in a way that doesn't make them martyrs. And we need to fight it in a way that doesn't push people into the arms of Marxism because we've somehow, we glorify them and we somehow make them superheroes by coming at them so hard. And here's a word to my leftist Marxist friends and in, in the uh, two or three of you that might actually watch my videos. Stop making martyrs of constitutionalists and patriots. You need to stop. You want, you, you want them to go away stop attacking them but keep attacking them because it's great because you're actually making people sit up and take notice but if you want them to go away leave them alone if you want to kill a plant don't give it water which if you keep watering that plant and you keep talking about how much you hate it and how much you want it to go away the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to keep growing and what you're actually doing right now is you're actually pushing those people you're trying to eliminate into the limelight. And as I said in another video, sooner or later, you're just going to make it where you've taken everything away from them and they have nothing to lose by exposing you. So weigh that out. Joseph McCarthy had a lot of stuff right, but his tactics were all wrong. And he's the reason we have to blame, or the person we have to blame for the stuff that we're having to fight right now. He missed the boat on battling communism by battling it the, the wrong way. And he set a precedence for the Marxists and the leftists today to attack genuine, red-blooded, patriotic constitutionalists as radicals. That's who we have to blame. Know your enemy so that you may battle them in an appropriate way. And until next time, Six Semper Tyrannus.